let us begin with our first uh, speaker. Uh, it's it's right up there on the wall. Do you see? UCLA Wi-Fi. All righty. So uh, our keynote address is the problem with money in politics, and our speaker is Professor Lawrence Lessig. Lawrence Lessig is the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School and director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. Prior to rejoining the Harvard faculty, Professor Lessig was at Stanford Law School, where he founded the school's Center for Internet and Society. He clerked for Judge Richard Posner on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and for Justice Antonin Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court. Mr. Lessig holds a degree in economics and management from the University of Pennsylvania, a master's in philosophy from Cambridge, and a law degree from Yale. In his latest book, Republic Lost, wherein he lays bare our corrupt system for financing campaigns, Professor Lessig writes, practically every important issue in American politics today is tied to this one issue. He advocates, and I quote, striking at the root, the thing that feeds the other ills, the thing we must kill first. With great pleasure, the Money Out Voters in Coalition welcomes the co-founder of Root Strikers, a Movi Coalition co-sponsor, Professor Lawrence Lessig. So I'm very shy and I don't like you to see me, which is why I turn the lights off before I start speaking. Um, So thank you and, and welcome to this event and I'm, I'm very honored and happy to have a chance to talk to this movement, which in many ways began here, uh, but has spread across the country. And I want to start by talking about what I think of as the problem. And I'm told that out here when you s tell a story, you need to begin with an image like this and a <laughs> phrase like this, so here we are. Once upon a time, there was a place called Lester Land. Now, you don't know from the introduction because it's a secret, so please don't tell anybody, but my first name is actually Lester, so I'm allowed to make fun of Lester's, and I want to make fun of Lester's for a moment in describing the problem by understanding this place called Lester Land. So Lester Land looks a lot like the United States. Like the United States, it has about 300 million people, and of those 300 and some million people, 144,000 are named Lester. So that means 0.05% of Lesterland is named Lester. Now, Lesters in Lesterland have this extraordinary power. There are two elections in every election cycle in, Le in Lesterland. There's a general election, and there is a Lester election. <laughs> and in the Lester election, the Lesters get to vote, and in the general election, all citizens over 18, if you have an ID in some states, get to vote. But here's the trick. To run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the Leicester election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. Now, this is the picture of democracy in Leicesterland. What can we say about Leicesterland? Well, we can say, number one, as the Supreme Court said in Citizens United, the people have the ultimate influence over elected officials in Leicester land, because after all, there is a general election. But there's that general election only after the Leicesters have had their way with the candidates who hope to run and win in that general election. Number two, obviously, this dependence upon the Leicesters produces a subtle, understated, we might say camouflaged bending to keep the Leicesters happy. <laughs> and number three, Reform that angers the Lesters is, we might say, unlikely. Okay, so that's Lesterland. There are three things I want you to understand now that you understand Lesterland. Number one, the United States is Lesterland. The United States is Lesterland. The United States also looks like this, also has two elections. One's called the general election. The other we should call the money election. 
In the general election, all citizens over 18, if you have an ID in some states, get to vote. In the money election, it's the funders who get to vote, the relevant funders of the campaigns. And as in Leicesterland, to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the, in the money election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. And here's the key. There are just as few relevant funders in our democracy as there are Lester's in Lesterland. Now you say, really? 0.05%? Well, here are the numbers. In this election cycle, 0.3% of Americans, 0.3, one third of 1% have given $200 or more in an election. 0.055% have given the maximum amount to any congressional or presidential candidate. 0.01% have given $10,000 or more in the election cycle. 0.0003% have given $100,000 or more. And my favorite statistic, 0.000042%, for those of you doing the numbers, you know that's 132 Americans, gave 60% of the super PAC money that was used in this last election cycle. So I look at this range, 0.3 to 0.01, and I'm a lawyer. I think it's fair for me to say it's about 0.05% who are the relevant funders in these elections, and these funders are our Lester's. Now, like you could say about Lester land, this is what you can say about USA land. Of course, the Supreme Court was right. The people have the ultimate influence over elected officials because there is a general election. But as in Lesterland, only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who wish to win in that general election. And number two, obviously, this dependence upon the funders produces a subtle and understated and camouflaged bending to keep the funders happy. Candidates for Congress and members of Congress spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get to power or to get their party back into power. And as they do that, they develop, as any of us would, a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters, as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues 1 to 10, but on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> and then point three, reform that angers the funders in our system, we can say is unlikely. So in this sense, I want to say first, the United States is Lesterland. Here's the second point. The United States is worse than Lesterland, worse than Lesterland. Because you can imagine in Lesterland, if we Lesters got a letter from the government that said to us, you guys get to pick. Who are the candidates that will run in the general election? You know, there are Lesters from every class. There are bla black Lesters and white Lesters. Not many women Lesters, but okay, let's put that detail aside for a second. There are Lesters from every class. You can imagine there would be a kind of aristocracy of us Lesters, right? It's at least possible. We would think we need to act in the good of Lesterland. It's our job. It's our purpose. It's our role. They look up to us, Lesters, to help them pick the best candidates who will run. But in our land, in this land, in USA land, the Lesters act for the Lesters. Because the shifting coalitions of interest that comprise the 0.05% are formed on the basis of whatever issue is just over the horizon. So if it's climate change legislation, you know it's coal companies and oil companies who comprise a significant portion of the Lesters. If it's healthcare, you know it's insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and doctors who form a significant component of the Lesters. Whatever the issue is, whatever the issue that has to be blocked, whatever reform needs to be stopped, you can read back from that and understand who makes up the Lesters. And when they gather together and make their contributions, they are not asking for legislation in the public interest. They are asking for legislation in their interest. So in this sense, the United States is worse than Lesterland. And finally, point number three, whatever one wants to say about Lesterland, in our land, in our version of Lesterland, in USA land, this conflicting dependence upon the Lesters versus the people is corruption, corruption. 
Now, I don't mean it's brown paper bag corruption with cash secreted to members of Congress. I don't mean it's Rob Lagojevich corruption where people are engaging in criminal acts. Indeed, I'm willing to stipulate the complaint I have has no criminality attached to it all. I'm willing to assume everything I'm describing is perfectly legal, perfectly legal. But even if it's perfectly legal, it is still corruption relative to the baseline that our framers gave us. Our framers gave us what they called a republic. And by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, as Madison described in Federalist 52, they meant a government that would have a branch that would be, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's the model of government. They have the people, they have the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces like that. Okay, so the people <laughs> and the government. An exclusive dependency, exclusive dependency, and so would the public good be found by that exclusive dependency. But here's the problem. Congress has evolved a different dependence. No longer a dependence upon the people alone, increasingly a dependence upon the funders. And this is a dependence too. It is different and conflicting from a dependence upon the people alone, however, so long as the funders are not the people. This is corruption. Corruption of the design that was to be this constitutional democracy. Now, this corruption has an effect. Its first effect is that Americans believe because of it, and I think Americans are right to believe this, but this is a separate question. Let's just focus on what Americans believe. Americans believe money buys results in Congress, quote, unquote. 75% of Americans, according to a poll we conducted for the book I published last fall, at that point, it was a bit higher Democrats than Republicans, but I guarantee you before the Republicans took control of the House in 2010, it was just as many Republicans as Democrats. So here it is, folks, the one thing we Americans all believe, money buys results in Congress. Leading to point number two, that belief erodes trust in the institution of Congress. ABC and the New York Times found last year that 9% of America had confidence in Congress, 9%. Now, we should put that in context. It is certainly the case, it is certainly the case at the time of the American Revolution, a higher proportion of Americans had confidence in the British crown than who have confidence in our Congress today. And that leads to point number three. This erosion erodes, <coughs> excuse me, erodes participation in this system. Rock the Vote, which in 2008 organized and turned out the largest number of young voters in the history of voting in America, we still don't have the numbers from this election, found that in 2010, a significant number of their young voters were just not going to show up. So they pulled them, they asked them why. And the number one reason by far, two to one over the second highest reason was, no matter who wins, corporate interest will still have too much power and prevent real change. And it's not just kids. The vast majority who could have voted in 2010 did not vote, in part at least because of this belief. And even in this election, 40% did not vote, in part at least, I suggest, because of this belief, corruption. And these are its consequences. OK, so what's the solution to that corruption? There's a systemic problem here. It is that the funders are not the people. There's a systemic solution to that problem. It is to make the funders the people, to give them away, right. give them away, and I know it makes it sound like I mean to give Congress away, and, and nobody would take Congress, so I don't mean that, but I mean <laughs> to give Congress one way to fund their campaigns at least without selling their souls and thereby without alienating America. And the one way, and I think the only way to do this, is to openly and firmly and loudly yell, we believe in citizen-funded campaigns. Now, what is that? Right? These are systems of small dollar funded campaigns. And at least right now, they're systems where candidates get to opt into a world where they agree to take small dollar funded contributions only, and the system amplifies those contributions to make it so they can win campaigns, never taking large contributions from anybody. Now, there are many versions of this. There's matching grant proposal uh, systems, such as Arizona or Maine or Connecticut. Connecticut adopted their system in its first year, 78% of the elected representatives were elected using the system where they took small contributions only, never had to take any large contributions, Democrats and Republicans alike. 
And New York City has a similar system, which now might become the model for the whole of New York State. There are tax credit systems, like Oregon, to give people the ability to contribute small dollars to can candidates who take small contributions and then get a credit on their tax system. There are voucher proposals, first proposed by Bruce Ackerman and Ian Ayers. I've described a, a proposal in my book, Republic Lost, which I call the Grant and Franklin Project, where everybody gets a $50 voucher they can give to any candidate or a part of it to any candidate who agrees that he or she will fund his or her campaign with vouchers only plus contributions of up to $100 from any citizen. So Grant, 50, Franklin, 100. And I think most importantly now we have the proposal introduced just this week, the American Anti-Corruption Act, which has a tax credit to fund a voucher program of $100 to make it so candidates can opt to take small dollar contributions and have an extraordinary resource and source for those small contributions. Or there are proposals that draft them all together. Congressman Sarbanes from Maryland has a proposal called the Grassroots Democracy Act, which has a matching fund proposal, it has a tax credit proposal, and it has a pilot for the voucher proposal all in one low-priced package. Okay, but each of these systems funds from the bottom up. Each of them is aiming to reduce the gap between the funders and the people. And each of them has as its objective to reverse the extraordinary inequality that exists in our system now, where the top 1% have 10 times the per capita influence that the bottom 99% have, to aspire to the ideal which is at the center of the way we allocate votes, which is one person, one vote. That is what citizen-funded campaigns means. Only citizens fund campaigns and all citizens fund campaigns. And if we had that, if we had a system where candidates took small dollar contributions only, then we all could believe as we desperately want to believe <laughs> that whenever Congress did something crazy, it was either because there were too many Democrats or because there were too many Republicans, but not because of the money because we would have removed that cynical assumption from the only plausible way to interpret what Congress does because we would have made it so that the funders were all of us. Okay, now, the question though, that got constantly presented when people like me and others, hundreds of others, push this kind of proposal is, is it even possible to imagine Congress embracing such an idea? Is it even possible? And there are moments where I wonder whether it's even possible. This man made me the most cynical I could possibly be about this. This is Jim Cooper, Democrat from Virginia. Man has been in Congress for as long as about 20 other members uh, of Congress. He said to me when I was interviewing him for my book, you have to understand, Capitol Hill has become a kind of farm league for K Street. <laughs> K Street, where the lobbyists work. And what he meant was, Members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. So 50% of the Senate between 1998 and 2004, according to Public Citizen, left the Senate to become lobbyists, 42% of the House. And as United Republic calculated just last spring, the salary increase for those they tracked as they moved from the House to becoming lobbyists was 1,452%. Pretty good business model, <laughs> even in Washington. So in a system where everybody depends upon this system surviving so that their retirement is set, so their kids can have their education paid, so that their two other vacation houses at least have something to support the mortgage, so this system can survive, how is it possible that we could imagine attacking the cancer which is this beltway through themselves. Because here's the fact, cancer does not cure itself. It does not cure itself. And it won't be cured by dinky little reforms, tiny little ideas, tinkering crumbs at the table that are being proposed by people who think if we just do a tiny little switch, we will magically change this system. Instead, what it needs is a movement unlike any we've seen since the civil rights movement or the progressive movement, taking on a corruption 
greater than anything we've seen since we ousted George III. Okay, now we have an opportunity for that movement. It's a kind of gift. It was a gift given to us by an unlikely institution. They don't give many gifts. This place, the Supreme Court. It's a gift given to us in the form of an opinion called Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, an opinion that held corporations have an unlimited power to spend whatever they want independent of political campaigns to promote or oppose any political candidate. That opinion sparked extraordinary outrage across the country, outrage which was across the political spectrum. So the Washington Post, a week after the opinion came out, found that 84% of Democrats opposed the opinion, 81% uh, of independents, and 76% of Republicans outraged at the idea that corporations would have this role in our political process. And that outrage translated into inspiration as an extraordinary range of new organizations like Move to Amend or Free Speech for People or 99 Rise began to embrace this cause and joining all sorts of organizations that had been around for much longer than this opinion, demanding that this decision be reversed. <laughs> and in the process, in the process of these organizations taking up this cause, millions have been recruited to this cause, millions. And many of the people in this room are responsible for that extraordinary activity of recruitment and awakening that has led America to recognize exactly what the problem here is. This is incredibly important. It will be remembered, this movement, as the first steps of the most important progressive movement we've seen in America in 100 years as the first steps, as the beginning. Because these steps can't be the end to that movement. This framing, this framing alone, or money is not speech, is the first steps. These means, the idea of calling upon Congress to pass resolution, to, uh, to pass an amendment, is a first step, a brilliant first step. Because what these means did was to build the recognition in America that something must be done. And we saw the product of that recognition in a poll that was conducted by Gallup in July of this year, when Gallup asked the Americans what was to be the priority for the next president. And on that list of 10 priorities, number two on that list was reducing corruption in the federal government. Number two, 87% of Americans identified this issue. And of course, they weren't thinking about Rob Blagojevich. They weren't thinking about Randy Duke Cunningham. They weren't thinking about bribery or criminal behavior. What they were thinking about was the unbelievable amounts of money in the political system, the sort of recognition which this movement had made salient to them. Now, of course, when you turn to the actual political campaigns, so that issue was invisible. <laughs> Neither Obama nor Romney on their web page even mentioned this issue. And indeed, it is the only issue on the top 10 which was not mentioned anywhere in the political campaign. And more troublingly, it's the first time in as long as we can see where an issue on that top 10 list <coughs> was not at the center of either the Democrat or Republican's platform for addressing the issues America thinks need to be addressed. So this is a measure of your success, a success you should be proud of and you should celebrate. But now we need to ask, what's next? What's next? What are the next steps for this movement? What's the message? What are the means? For it's my view that they must evolve. They must evolve. This message must evolve. And here's the point. This change, this attack on that cancer, must be fundamentally cross-partisan. I don't mean bipartisan, kind of kumbaya, we all agree with each other. We don't agree with each other. But I mean it cuts across partisan lines. Because there's been one time in American history where we have attempted a fundamental reform like this that was not cross-partisan. That was 150 years ago in the context of a civil war. 
Instead, every other major movement to change the fundamental way in which government functioned was essentially cross-partisan. And in a world where we're calling for an amendment that requires 34 states to join with, 38 states to join with us, we cannot win if the issue is polarized, if the nation is divided about this question. And what that means is we have to learn to speak so the other side can hear. Speak so the other side can hear. And in this, I was reminded after talking to a friend who studies the history of the civil rights movement that there's a parallel in the civil rights movement. If you think about the civil rights movement at the end of the 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s, the fundamental struggle the movement had was how do they have people to show up, to turn out, to express their anger and frustration with the existing injustice of the American system and to demand a change. And there were two schools. There's a school associated with Malcolm X that said the way to get them to show up is to tell them to be incredibly angry, to be furious, and to demand the changes which hundreds of years ago should have been granted to African Americans, and to use whatever means, including, if it came to it, violence to demand this change. And in response to that completely plausible, at the time seemed eminently sensible, recommendation for how to bring about and demand the changes that African Americans were entitled to, Martin Luther King had a different view. King's view was, look, you can get 12% or 14% of America to show up and demand change, but 14% of America is not enough. Instead, he counseled a movement that could speak so that the other side could hear not speak with violence, where if whites saw violence, they would shut their eyes and close their ears and demand the violence end, but speak through nonviolence. So that when whites from the North saw African Americans being beaten up and bitten by dogs and not respond with violence, they would have to stop and listen and hear and understand. Speak so the other side can hear and hear too. In my view, we need a certain discipline here, a discipline in this movement, a discipline that makes it possible so that we speak so that the other side in this debate can hear what we're saying too. So here are the ways to that end. The first thing is to recognize what the power is that we have. Now, the Chattarati in America think that the really interesting division in American politics is between the left side and the right side. I think the interesting division in American politics is between the inside and the outside. The inside, the kind of world inside that beltway in Washington, D.C., and then the outside, the rest of America. And when you listen to what they talk about and contrast it to what the rest of us talk about, it suggests a remix of a very famous book, Washington is from Mars and we are from Earth. <laughs> Now, the point to recognize is that these outsiders have a certain politics, following Nigel Cameron. Let me just call it, to be kind of geeky, exopolitics, exopolitics. And the exopolitics is not a politics of politicians. It's a politics of citizen politics, citizens demanding that their politics change, citizens who are not congressman wannabes or representative wannabes, citizens who want to have the freedom to go back to their life but recognize they need to stand up for a week or a month or a year or five years and shake the insanity out of their government. And there are many instances, many examples of this over the past 15 years, and I think they're increasingly frequent, these waves of open source energy that bubble up and have an effect and begin to define what this movement could be. I think the move on in 1998 was the first of these. When two Berkeley programmers look up from their computer screens and recognize that the United States Congress is considering impeaching a man because he lied about having sex. And they said, what the hell? What the hell? There are real problems that America needs to address. This is way down that list, way down that list. And so they started a movement that gathered signatures from millions of people within a couple of weeks, from Democrats and Republicans alike, that said, censure the man and move on. 
And that movement, appearing out of nowhere, shocked Washington and forced Washington to reconsider the craziness that had swept over the inside. I think the Tea Party, the grassroots component of the Tea Party movement, not the Beltway Tea Party people, but the grassroots Tea Party movement was a similar exo-political movement that bubbled up using what they self-describe as the open source energy of the internet to rally people behind their cause. I think the Occupy movement was an exo-political movement which manifested itself and was created solely by the way in which people noticed and recognized and followed the online activity that made them salient and significant. I think the extraordinary movement to stop the latest craziness emanating from this part of the country to regulate what's called, quote, piracy on the internet, a bill which, when it was introduced, Chris Dodd, the head of the Motion Picture Association of America, you know, that's the same Chris Dodd who was senator from Connecticut and promised he would never become a lobbyist. He's the guy I'm talking about, head of the Motion Picture Association of America, said he had 66 signatures in the Senate to support this act. And yet within a couple weeks after an extraordinary net uprising, including Wikipedia shutting down for a, today, for a day, and hundreds of thousands of telephone calls to Capitol Hill telling them to stop, SOPA was withdrawn. This is a kind of power. It's a ground up power. It's new, some from the geeky community think it's new. But if it's hope, if there's hope for this movement, I think it is in this exo-politics. But here's the problem with exo-politics. Too much in this exo-political movement is fundamentally polarized. Like everyone, like politicians, like the political parties, like the media, like the dot orgs that try to rally us, they practice this business model of polarization. They recognize, their managers recognize, they profit the more they divide us, the more they teach us to hate them, the more they rally us to the loyalty to our side, the more they profit from us, the more they destroy the possibility that we can work with that side to bring about the change we need. We've produced what we could call the Ray-Ban culture, polarized, and very, very cool. Okay. <laughs> now the answer, I think, is to begin to focus on the right message and the right method. So let's focus first on the message. There is a way of talking about this problem that everybody can assent to, from the left and the right. And that's to focus on this root. The root is corruption, this picture of the way our government functions. My view, it is only this frame that can unite, unite people as diverse as these and these. <laughs> it is my view that this frame will not unite people from the left and the right. Instead, this at the core. And in pushing this at the core, we've been given another gift. Not by Stephen Colbert, but by Stephen Colbert's lawyer and a team that he worked with in pulling this together. That is the American Anti-Corruption Act, which as you pour through it, you will recognize it to be an extraordinary collection of changes that if implemented would fundamentally reshape the corruption of Washington. So there's a provision that basically shuts down the Farm League for K Street. There's a, position, a, pro, a provision that creates citizen-funded campaigns building on the idea of vouchers funded through tax credits. There's a provision that fundamentally changes and challenges Citizens United, building an idea and an observation that I made in my book, Citizens Republic Lost. And there's fundamental enhanced transparency that builds on the insights of the Sunlight Foundation to make it possible for us to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and how much time they're spending raising money in order to do it. This package is what I mean by bold, not puny reform. It is this kind of bold reform, not the puny reform, that we should be pushing. Because in my view, this would work to change the way this system functions. So that's the message, a message fo focused on corruption. Here's the method. It's a method that the wolf pack has embraced. Chang's sitting over here. The wolf pack has embraced. So there's been enormous success 
in this progress towards petitioning our government to do the right thing. We write them letters, letters in the form of resolutions. The resolutions say something like, dear Congress, please cure yourself. Please, pretty please, 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 please. <laughs> Those letters get filed. Sometimes they get filed in a circular filing cabinet. And my suggestion is we need to think about how we can act with more consequence. More consequence. And actually, Article 5, the provision in our Constitution that enables us to amend the Constitution, begins to have a map for how we could act with more confidence. Because when Article 5 was first drafted, the only means by which it could, the amendments could be generated was by Congress proposing the amendments. And some clever soul said in the Constitutional Convention, hey, wait a minute, what if Congress is the problem? <laughs> he said, that's a good point. So in addition to Congress proposing amendments, Article 5 embeds a procedure by which the states can call on Congress to call a convention. A convention which proposes amendments which, like the other amendments, are only valid if three-fourths of the states, 38 states, ratify them. Now, there are two characteristics of this, uh, this way of proceeding that I think are central. First, it is cross-partisan because People can be calling for a convention for any reason they want. And there is a strong conservative movement calling for a convention to address the problems of debt or the problems of balanced budget, ideas that I don't have much sympathy for, but I do have sympathy for the idea that we need a way to address questions that isn't controlled by Congress. And it is also the only procedure that has actually in our history worked to peacefully bring about a fundamental change in the way the government is structured. Now, you can say never before have we had a convention. That's true. But we've been close once. That was 100 years ago, 1911, when the Senate was still appointed by the legislatures and Congress was called upon to fix the Senate because people perceived that to be the core of the corruption inside of the system. And Congress refused to fix the Senate by refusing to send out an amendment that could be ratified to change the way the Senate was elected. And when the movement to call a convention was one state shy of the number it needed to call a convention, Congress was terrified. And Congress's terror quickly changed their refusal into an agreement to send out to the states an amendment that would eventually be the amendment that would make the Senate elected. So the very process of bringing about the movement for a constitutional Article V convention forced the change inside the system that those who pushed that convention wanted. And in this process, every new state that calls, that passes a resolution calling on Congress to call for a convention is one step closer to there being a convention. Every new state is consequence, has consequence for the potential that is needed to bring about the pressure necessary to force that cancer to be cured. So this is the method that I think we need to increasingly consider, to talk about openly and to discuss and debate and recognize there are questions it raises, I get. But we need to move and evolve to address those questions if we're going to have a strategy that can in the end win. So here it is. I have a slogan. I'm not good at slogan writing, but here's the slogan. Exo-politicians of the world, we have to unite behind the AA Act and force change with an Article V convention. There it is. Okay, it's not quite a bumper sticker yet. I think it could be tweeted, but you know, not quite a bumper sticker yet. But this is the work we need to push to understand how this architecture, these architectures of changes can be the next step of this incredibly important movement for change. Now, let me just end with this. I had the, uh, the honor of going to, uh, Mass uh, to New Hampshire earlier in this week to talk to um, some climate change scientists about the problem of money in their field. And I had to start by uh, confessing to them that I know, though this is controversial, Al is still my hero here. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I showed them this clip from a TED Talk that Al gave. I'm a big advocate of changing the light bulbs and 
buying hybrids and different, I've put 33 solar panels on our house and dug the geothermal wells and done all of that uh, other stuff. But as important as it is to change the light bulbs, it's more important to change the laws. And when we change our behavior in our, in our daily lives, we sometimes leave out the citizenship part and the democracy part. In order to be optimistic about this, we have to become incredibly active as citizens in our democracy. In order to solve the climate crisis, we have to solve the democracy crisis. The democracy crisis. Now, I have never been to an event that depressed me more than that event with climate change scientists talking about the state of climate change knowledge. Because as we sat there and focused upon the fact that indeed the problem was much worse than we thought. That it turned out Al Gore and his filmmaker Davis Guggenheim, who's in the room here, were apologists because they described it I'm a joking, of course, right? They, are dried, they described it in a way that turns out not to be as profoundly threatening as it is. I reflected on the fact that we're not making progress on this fundamental, for me, the most fundamental issue. Indeed, after 2008, when both candidates ran saying this was a priority, 2012 happened, and neither candidate even mentioned the issue. Incredibly depressing. And then as I sat there and I thought about every other issue that we think of as important, getting a healthcare system that works and we could afford, getting reform on Wall Street that doesn't make our economy vulnerable to the gambles of the richest people in our society, finding a way to address the fundamental debt crisis that will burden our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. I came back to this democracy crisis, this democracy crisis. I thought, what the hell are we doing about this democracy crisis? I don't think of it so much as the democracy crisis. I think of it as the republic crisis. It's the cr crisis of living in Lesterland. The crisis of living in Lesterland. And we were warned about this crisis. When Franklin was carried by, from the Constitutional Convention in 1787 and stopped on the street in Philadelphia by a woman, she said, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? Franklin said, a republic, madam. If you can keep it, a republic, a representative democracy, a government dependent upon the people alone. We have not kept that republic. We have lost that republic. And we must urgently find a way to act to get it back. And how? through a certain discipline, through a charity of that movement, we, us, this movement, needs that discipline and charity now if we're going to stop the insanity that is destroying this nation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.